Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome um, to the seminar that you needed to have so that you could find out everything about copyright, fair use, fair dealing, piracy, really anything. And tonight's an opportunity to obviously hear about this, the regimes we work under and other regimes, but it's also an opportunity for you to ask questions. We've got a great panel here who I think should be able to answer every question that you ever had about copyright, so I really would take advantage of it. My name's Kingston Anderson. I'm the CEO of the Australian Directors Guild. The Australian Directors Guild works with AusDocs to run this session every month on topics about documentary. If you're a director, you should join the Australian Directors Guild, so see me afterwards, um, because we represent over a thousand directors across Australia. We also represent directors in New Zealand as well, and we advocate and support and generally um, make a lot of directors for the screen in this country better off. And for documentary makers, we work a lot with the director-producer, which maybe a lot of you are in this room. Um, my background is as a filmmaker and as a director. Um, my background in copyright is what I've learnt in the job that I'm doing at the moment. So I don't have as much knowledge, but I have a, a general knowledge which I'm going to try and impart to you. Um, and the rest of the panel have a lot of detailed knowledge which I hope they will you'll get across to you and, and as I say I hope you've got some questions about specifics. Don't worry about the, what the questions are. It doesn't matter how, you may think that they're, oh no this is a pretty silly question. They're not silly questions. You'd be surprised at the questions that get asked um, of the Copyright Council, of lawyers, myself and a lot of it is because people don't actually know what the system is and how it works. It's quite detailed. In fact, um, Kate, if you could just hold up that book. I, Kate did threaten to read the Copyright Act tonight <laughs> so that you could uh, you get a completely detailed approach to this. But that just gives you an idea of um, how big it is. And it's also the 50th anniversary of copyright in Australia. 1969? Was it 1969 or 68? Passed in 68. Passed in 68 and proclaimed in 69. So it took them a year <laughs> from passing it to proclaiming it. So um, we've had 50 years of, of this regime and 50 years of copyright law in Australia. So there's a, a fair bit there. I'm going to introduce our panel. Um, in the middle, the gentleman in the middle, is Grant McAvaney. So Grant is He's commenced as the CEO of the Australian Copyright Council after six years with the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, where he oversaw disputes and litigation. So anything, if you have any idea you want to talk about the ABC, this is the man to talk to tonight. From his time both as a partner at Minter Ellison Lawyers and senior legal counsel at Nine MSN, Grant has significant litigation and commercial experience in both media and intellectual property law, as well as expertise with legislative and policy reviews. He's widely active across the legal profession, including lecturing media law to university students. He's a passionate advocate for the rights of all creators. Uh, on this side, or the other side of, of Grant, is Kate Haddock. Kate is uh, an intellectual property lawyer, and she has been one since 1989. She's a foundation partner of Banky Haddock Fiora, which was established in 1995. She's extensive experience advising collecting societies and publishers in relation to all aspects of their business, including particular copyright and competition law. She provides advice on all aspects of copyright management and transactions relating to dealings with copyright properties. In particular, she has close experience in all aspects of the legal issues facing collecting societies, including under competition legislation. Kate also conducts litigation and manages disputes and enforcement proceedings relating to copyright and competition and consumer law. She has extensive experience in the Copyright Tribunal of Australia, which might be a question you have, what's the Copyright Tribunal of Australia as well. Her clients include collecting societies, publishers and other companies with creative interest. She's also the chair of the Australian Copyright Council. She's a member of the Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance. And for many years, she is on the management of the Copyright Society of Australia. Um, so basically, if there isn't anything about copyright, she doesn't know, no one else in this room or in this, on this city probably does. So get your copyright questions. Next to her, and this is another part of the topic which we think relates directly to, is Laurie Flexer. Now Laurie has worked in the Australian Screen Industries 1982. Her production experience as a producer, line producer and production manager can come as a wide range of genres from documentaries to feature films, telemovies and corporate videos. 
In 2003, Laurie joined the Australian Film Commission, one of the agencies amalgamated into Screen Australia. Promoted to Director of Development, she supported the development and production of features, documentaries, short films and digital media projects. She was appointed General Manager of the Motion Picture Distributors Association in 2010, representing the major film distributors in Australia. So again, if you want to know about film distribution, grab Laurie because she, she runs, runs all of those companies <laughs> in, in, in coordinating them. And in 2012, she took on the additional role of Executive Director of Creative Content Australia, raising awareness about the value of screen content and the impact of piracy. Laurie is a passionate advocate of copyright protection having earned her living as a filmmaker for 25 years, rails against the injustice of consumers unwittingly or unknowingly stealing the hard-earned revenue of content makers, while also undermining future investment in creative projects. So that's our panel tonight. Um, and basically, I think they've got all the, the skills that, and you know, information you may want. i will also say to the panel, don't be afraid to jump in, particularly on my talk when I'm getting it wrong, if I'm getting it wrong. And also, if you think there's something right at that point you want to ask, don't, fear, don't worry about jumping in then, but also reminded, we need you to get you to the mic, okay? But there will be adequate time afterwards for questions, so if you want to get your questions lined up. But panel, please jump in. If you think there's a comment to be made or a point to be made or an, or an example to be given, um, we hope to give you a number of examples, um, basically, of projects. And I'm going I'm to get our friends in the bio box to switch over so I can um, bring up my PowerPoint. Sorry about this. I don't usually do PowerPoints, but I saw this is one that I sort of needed to, um, <laughs> needed to do to make sure I get my thoughts correctly in line because um, I think it's a tricky area sometimes and a little bit of information written down is quite useful, so bear with me on this. Um, I think I'll start very quickly saying we have a system in Australia called Fair Dealing. Okay, which is what you would do with the deal with as a filmmaker. And um, fair dealing really is trying to give us a fair way to deal with copyright issues that you may come across as a filmmaker. Um, there's a particular company in the world that uses a lot of copyright material, and we'll talk a bit about them later on. Um, basically, audiovisual material is protected by copyright in a cinematographic film. Okay? That doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what sort of film that is, whether it's a documentary, a feature film, a television series, a short film, it's a cinematographic film. And that's the definition that, was, that we use within that. Um, but the underlying rights, the music, um, images, certain things, may be copyrighted somewhere else. And so you may need to consider those when you're making a film. It sounds like obvious stuff, but as a filmmaker, you will have to think about what's behind the person that you're interviewing or what music is playing within the, the soundtrack of your film. And you will need to get some advice on this, legal advice. And there are a number of pla places you need, because sometimes you don't know what you need permission for. Like, do I have permission to use this here? Is that, am I breaching a copyright of our friends at um, South Park? Simple question. Um, not really. Because under our fair dealing regime, um, there are exceptions. And these exceptions allow us to use things in, for certain things, for research or study, criticism or review, parody or satire. One could say I'm possibly satirising them, maybe not. Reporting use or for professional advice. So there are things within that you don't require to get permission for. So I think the obvious one is comedy. And if you watch any comedy show on Australian television, they're putting up clips and they're doing all sorts of stuff all the time, that's completely okay within our regime. So there are some exceptions. All this information, by the way, I'll tell you where you can get all this. It's all pretty freely available and very easy to get. So that's just the, that's the, the fair dealing. Hey, but this is not America. The other thing you may have heard of is a thing called fair use. And fair use is the system that works in the United States. And there's been a lot of talk about this because there's approaches and there's suggestions that we should adopt this system, which is an American system. I'll say a little bit about this, and you know, my colleagues will also talk a bit more about this as well. But I think to understand fair use, it's a, I'm trying to keep it as simple as I can because it's obviously more complicated than a few slides. But fair use is a completely different system because the Americans have a different system. I mean, we don't have free speech. We don't have the First Amendment. So if you get out 
on the box, box and say, you know, um, Grant McAvaney is the biggest dickhead in the world and, you know, da-da-da, he can sue you, okay? But if he did that, you know. So, yeah, well, <laughs> you'd be fine, okay. So, but but the, the, the laws is quite different. And so the system that they have is, is, doesn't quite fit our system. There's, there's some of the argument is there as well. And there's been a lot of talk about fair use giving you access to everything. Well, it's not, not true in many ways. In many cases, you still got to go through the same process to get the information. And there is someone in the audience who's got a lot of experience in this, who I might call on with some questions, <laughs> um, who does a lot of work in using other material in programs as well. And she has some very good first-hand experience. So fair use is a system that you may have heard of. We don't need to talk enormous, but I'm going to let Kate talk a little bit more about that in detail as well. The other problem we've got with copyright, of course, are the pirates. And um, I don't think I need to, to explain much to you about that because that's become a huge problem with our industry. Um, I was telling a couple of panellists the other day I was looking for a trailer for a movie that hasn't been released yet. So I typed the trailer into, the, into YouTube, the title, and what came up, a banner that said, would you like to watch the entire movie? Click here and we'll take you to a site where you can watch it for free. And this is a film that hasn't been released yet. And, and, and every time I, that, you see that, you just get, you know, pretty angry. And, and we come across a lot of, one of our members was, we, we take films to America to sell to, try and sell to distributors. So one of our members, we were taking a film to screen in LA and New York, and, we, and one of the people who was speaking about it said, oh, I want to get a copy of the film so I could see it. And we said, oh, God, how are we going to do that? And I'll send you a deal. And we were trying to work. He said, that's OK. I've just found it on Google, and it's, it's freely available on this site. Well, the filmmaker was absolutely horrified because the film hadn't been released in the United States. So it's, it's an issue, and I'm, I'm going to let Laurie um, really talk a bit more about that. But it's pretty obvious, you know, then people re reproducing your stuff. Now, the other part of this for documentary makers, which is something that has been raised a couple of times, is a lot of documentary makers make shoot original footage. And a lot of that original footage will end up at the National Film and Sound, Sound Archive. So one of our colleagues, um, a well-known documentary filmmaker, was approached by another filmmaker to use some of her original footage in their film. And naturally, they said, well, what's the film about? Well, the film was contrary to what the footage was originally shot for. So it's like saying, I want to make a film about racism, how white people are good and black people are bad, and I want to use your footage from your film that is anti, you know, that's saying the opposite in my film. It's a bit like the Jimmy Barnes thing about his song being used for the banner for a, a, a right-wing organisation. That's an issue that, as a documentary filmmaker, you may need to consider. And I would argue, and again, my colleagues can correct me, in an American system, that's possible. In our system, it's not. So that's something that's come up a few times, basically. Um, it really comes back to this statement, which is something I think we all agree on, which is it's up to the person who created the material. It's actually your copyright and your call. Um, if you want to put your film online for free, go for your life. No one's going to stop you, okay? But you don't want someone else to do that. Because in your case, it's, it's your living and... and it could be your future superannuation, as we say at the Guild, um, it's your future superannuation. There's a little film that was made in 1972, 73, called The Rocky Horror Picture Show. That has played every single day since it was released around the world since then. Royalties from that flow back to the director, the writer, the producer, the... the sorry? Composer. Composer, everybody basically who created that show, continually receives money from that film, okay? And I don't see that stopping, <laughs> you know? It's now a stage show, as the stage show, it's because it was originally a stage show, then it became a movie. So it, it, it's a good example of how something, and I know when they did that, I mean, the, the original Rocky Horror show was in a theatre about half this size when it was first at the Royal Court Theatre in London. So it had, you know, a seating capacity of about 30 or 40. And then when they made the film, you know, none of them thought it would be what it became. So it, you don't know. You really don't know where things will go from your point of view as a creator, whether it's a document, whatever sort of film you're making. So it's incredibly important that you protect yourselves from that. One of the ways you protect yourself um, are through moral rights. 
And these, this is something the Americans don't have, by the way. This is something that we have and a number of countries around the world have. And that's really enables you to protect your work in this country, and particularly for directors, which obviously I represent. It is the only thing that we have to protect directors' work being maligned or changed. And in many ways, you know, they could be, someone could be changing your work, could be a producer, could be anyone. So the moral rights code is something that's very, very important. And that's another way that you can protect, basically, your copyright. And to not, as I said before, not have your work falsely attributed, which is of great concern to many people with the, f the free availability of copyright material um, being used in all sorts of things. I mean, there's a whole area of trans... I'm going to get the right word, transmogrify, well, where things are transformed from one form to another. And there's a lot of legal battles going on in the United States where photographs and images have been taken and turned into something else and then said that that's a new work. And so those areas are something that are, for, for you, it's really about people taking your original material and turning it into something else. So, I mean, that's, that's sort of who owns the footage is a really important part of what you need to do as a filmmaker, both for yourself, your own footage, but probably more importantly, and what we're going to talk a bit more about today, the work that's in your film. So these are the, some of the things that you're going to have to look for clearances on. Music, artistic works, literary works, dramatic works, parts of other films, titles. I think there's a... I, I see if there'll be a question on this, but usually there's a question that is, oh, but if I use less than 45 seconds, is that OK? Does anyone know the answer to that question? I know you do. Is there a time limit? So these are sorts of questions that these guys will answer for you if you have them later on. But you do need to get the work. I'll tell a story about when I was, did my first documentary some years ago. It was a little one. We were, we, my partner and I, who now produces and works in documentaries, we'd been fascinated by our daughter's school that had been involved in a thing called the Rocker Stedford, which was a a big event in, in, in Australia, it actually went around the whole country, and basically a school lip syncs a story to all this contemporary music. It's like a, a mashup of music. And we were fascinated because the particular school my daughter went to was a very multicultural school, it wasn't a rich school, it was a public school, but it won, these, it won year after year. And, and, I, and we were going, how come this school, which, and, all, and it was up against an oh, incredible number of very rich schools who put enormous amounts of money, in fact employed choreographers and a whole lot of people to do, against this school, which was a multicultural school where there were issues with the kids in the school and whatever. So we decided to follow this and follow it. And of course, one of the biggest, pro we, we shot this whole video, they actually won that year, so it was a great outcome, good story, and we interviewed the kids and we did all that. And our aim was to really provide something for the school to record this quite extraordinary event. But it actually turned out really well, and so we thought, well, let's look, investigate some things. One of the problems we came up against was the music in, the, in it. We had probably 50 songs in it, contemporary musical songs from all the different sources. Now, the only way we could ever try to sell that commercially was if we got the clearances for that. And when we did the costings on it, it was quite expensive, I think $50,000 at the end of the day to get the clearances on it. And at that point, we we actually questioned, we actually didn't make it for that. We actually made it for the school, <laughs> it was, you know, a labour of love. And so we approached those owners of those works and we said, well, we actually don't, we, what we want to do is we want to just sell it to the, the community. They gave us all the licences for nothing. Um, because they said, well, that's fine. It's not a commercial, you're not doing a commercial venture. But if you want to put it out broadcast, you need to come. And we said, that's fine, and we never did. And I thought that was interesting because there's, you always hear the bad stories about, you know, oh, no, I can't get this song and whatever, you know, so no one will give me the rights to this song, I'll have to, I'll have to pay $20,000 for this song. Well, I think that's true, that there are some things like that, but I think you have, your reality is, it is someone else's work. And so you have to judge how you use that. I'd also say, you know, to any composers in the room, why don't you get someone to compose some music for you? Because that's also a really important thing. The music thing is one that comes up Again, and I think you've got probably, Kate, you've probably got a story about that in particular documentary. But it is one that comes up a lot. And I think it's, um, I, there's no free ride anywhere in the world. If people tell you that, they're telling you a whole lot of lies. Because it doesn't matter where you are in the world. If you take a song, a major song that exists in the world, and put it in your film, 
you will need to get it cleared. Am I right on that, Naomi? Yeah, except for Myanmar. Except for Myanmar. Okay, all right, except for Myanmar, okay. <laughs> if there's a pop song from Myanmar that I don't know about that we want to put in your film, okay. But the point is, it's, it's, it, the, the systems are pretty much the same around the world, and I think there's a lot of people who say, if we adopt this system, it won't be. And, you know, I have to put my hand up and say, there are some issues that we have with some of the larger companies in this world, like Google and YouTube, who actually thrive off using content that they don't pay for. Okay, so that's my point of view. I'm not going to force it upon you, but I, I believe in protection of copyright and protect, protection of creators' rights, and I think that's one of the things we're going to talk about tonight here as well. Um, but, you know, as I said, you can share it with the world. If you want to give it away, there's plenty of ways to do it. Creative Commons is one. There's plenty of ways to do it. I know that there are some people putting movies out on the web simply because they want a lot of people to see it. Well, that's great. That's your choice. But if you don't want that to happen, <laughs> um, I'll let, I mean, I'm sure, I'll really tell you how disastrous that can be. If you don't want that to happen, then you need to enforce those copyright protections. And you need to be mindful of other people's copyright within the work as well. Um, and if you're unclear, you come in the director's guild, we say all the time, check with a lawyer. Now, you'll all say, oh, yeah, but they're too expensive. Kate, how much do you charge? No, I won't say. <laughs> yeah, I charge a lot. <laughs> At the end of the day, almost without fail, everyone who said that to me has spent more money to solve a problem than they would have spent if they'd started with a lawyer in the first place. And you have to make some judgment calls, but you can do it on your own. And this is the place you can do it, is the Copyright Council. And at the copyright.org.au, there is an enormous number of resources which answer questions across the board. And in fact, Mr. Mr. McAvaney here has brought one of the books, that, the, that many books that um, Copyright Council put out, but also they put out an enormous number of free um, information sheets on all sorts of topics. So that service is available to you, okay? <coughs> You've obviously, some of you, have some of you, have any of you, just honestly, before I've talked about it, have you heard of the Copyright Council? Anyone here? Okay, well, yeah, okay, a few. Have you heard of Arts Law? Okay, yeah, so they're two sources. They operate differently. Um, obviously, the Copyright Council has expertise in copyright. So I would advise you, if you've got questions, you've got information you want, that's the place to go, and you'll get the information. And if the, the sheets don't have it, you can then call them. And they have a service to provide for you, if you, but you go to go through a process. So, you know, everyone's saying, "Oh, I haven't got, I can't get advice." Well, I don't think that's true. There's plenty of there's plenty of ways to do it as well. No one can solve your problems if you want that song and you can't afford it. Okay, that's just the world we live in. And if you're a documentary filmmaker, work around it, as all documentary filmmakers do. If you can't afford that song, if it's vital, then you've got to find a way of doing it. I don't think stealing things <laughs> is the answer to any of this stuff. And I don't think uh, infringing on other people, other creators who worked hard to where they are, is a way forward. So I suppose that's my message. And from the point of view of directors, I think it's important that you stick to that. Thanks very much, Kingston. And uh, a couple of, I, I think a couple of things in response to what Kingston is saying is, yes, you should ask anything that comes to mind because lawyers are very good at pretending that they know the answer to everything. So that's why we always encourage you to, to ask what you want. We'll, we'll, we'll pretend we know. Um, and just rem please keep this in mind that, um, so I haven't been at the Australian Copyright Council for very long, although I have done lots of media and IP work over the years in various ways. But Kate and Kingston are both more board members, so if you make me look bad, um, the result may be that I lose my job. I don't want you to f be worried about that, but just be mindful of that. So the one question, I was almost nervous if to see what the answer was if Kingston then asked the next question. Have you heard of the Australian Copyright Council? But the question, do you know what the Australian Copyright Council does? So I, I won't ask you. Let me just tell you very briefly. But it is um, the peak body... 
that is interested in protecting copyright for Australian creators. And it, it in turn represents really most of the major collecting societies of Australia and the major peak creative groups. So there's about 27 members at the moment from the Australian Screen Association, Directors Guild, uh, Australian Society of Authors, APRA AMCOS, all, all sorts of the, the creative types that you might think. And our funding comes mostly from the Australia Council for the Arts, but uh, with the assistance of our members as well. So in protecting and promoting and valuing copyright, we do all sorts of things. Kingston has, um, and I'm pleased that he has, talked about some of the free things we do. So a lot of work goes into the, the fact sheets, and so you can, there are booklets to purchase, but they're fairly dense. But the fact sheets um, are available online for free. Uh, they are based on very much the, the practical issues that we see coming in from all sorts of creators, including, of course, from filmmakers. So if you haven't looked at them, you, you certainly should. Um, and we do all sorts of other things as well, including education by way of seminars and uh, government submissions. So there is a sort of that wider thing going on. But particularly if you're looking for, I guess, some um, an accessible point for legal advice, we would hope that you, you keep us in mind and go to the website. If you can't find what you want, then you let us know and use our legal advice service. That's what we're there for. So what I thought I might do, and I'm really basing this on, I guess, the most common questions we've had in relation to film, both back in my ABC days and in my Australian Copyright Council days. Does anyone in the audience just want to yell out? Does anyone want to guess what the most common question is? We've actually looked. The most common question is, can I use this for free? Okay. That probably isn't that surprising when you think about it. But the most common question is, I've got this bit of music, this picture, this bit of film, whatever it is. Can I use it without paying for it? So what I thought I would quickly do is just run through, I guess, a few of the main sort of issues. So I'm not going to talk any longer than a few minutes. I'm not going to go into all the detail of the law, but I hope that perhaps as far as the discussion tonight, it might lead to some more questions that you might have. You can ask more specifics. I should say I have no experience in copyright law in Myanmar, so I'm going to defer to you if there's any questions about that. But, uh, but otherwise... Um, I also have this knack that if I don't know the answer, I just look at Kate until she answers it anyway. So that's my backup plan. Um, I should also say this copyright's interesting. I, I mean, my involvement is I've always been on both sides from a lawyer's perspective. So I've acted for the creators and I've acted for the creators who want to use the creative work of other creators. Um, and it can be fairly emotional copyright. Uh, if you want to use someone's work, you have this emotional reaction of, I want to use it, I should be able to use it. It's it's for the It's for the... I have an ultimate good that I want to achieve. But the flip side I find that for creators, if someone dares take a, a bit of your work without asking you first at least, um, all hell breaks loose. So it's a bit of a two-edged sword with copyright and you sometimes need to keep that in mind when you're working out, well, what should we do? What sort of questions do we ask? But let me tell you the common things we see, the common issues we have to consider as I said, that mostly stem from the question of, can I use this for free? So one of the most common questions is, well, it's only a breach of copyright if you if it's an if it's a substantial use. So in case you don't know the answer to Kingston's question, um, is it okay to use less than 45 seconds of a film? Of course, the absolute answer, if you're waiting for it, is it depends. It depends. So whether or not something is a substantial and insubstantial use uh, requires you to step back, look at the product as a whole, the, the, the amount that you're using, the value of it, the purpose of it, all of those qualitative factors to work out, well, is it a substantial and insubstantial use? Probably the tougher, uh, the tougher answer is um, it probably is a substantial use, is, is probably more accurate. So, for example, there has been some judges who've said even one still shot of a film could constitute a substantial use of the film. It might depend what the still shot is. So if you had sort of some inconsequential scene and it was just the still shot from some sort of inconsequential movie or something that no one will recognise, it might not be an issue. But then you can probably think of iconic still shots that might pop in your head. I always think of the pottery scene in Ghost, um, I haven't really moved on from the 90s, so that's no surprise. You probably are much more modern with its people than I am, so I'm sure you can come up with some sort of more modern, iconic scene. Okay, anything? okay all right. <laughs> that was me doing my backup. That didn't work. I should have gone the other side. I haven't seen a film since Guardians of the Galaxy. Okay, all right. 
Um, so in substantial use, the, the answer is often it, de it depends. And that's where it's good if you can get a bit of guidance on it. But and again, I'm, I don't want to try and get bore you with all the specifics. There is a bit of protection for artistic works popping up in the background, so incidental use. So there may be circumstances where they're going to be little things in the background, like a logo, for example. I mean, you see news reporters standing in um, Pitt Street Mall all the time. There'll be logos behind them. They're artistic works. They're protected by the Copyright Act. But um, unless there's some sort of attention draw to them, that's one of those areas where you're probably okay. Another common question, and this... Um, is something that I've heard from a variety of media clients, uh, whether they're in TV, print, whatever it might be. Um, the usual perception or the usual thing is, oh, but I found this on the internet, so this is in the public domain. And no, just because it's on the internet does not mean that something is in the public domain. Public domain has a very specific meaning, really, which is, has the copyright protection for that particular thing actually expired? And there's lots of little complicated rules, but you need to find out, often need to find out when it was made, who made it. The starting position is usually it's the, the copyright exists for um, the life of the creator plus 70 years. So if you're hoping to use any Lennon-McCartney songs, yes, Mr Lennon's passed on, but Sir Paul is alive and kicking. So you've got 70 plus however much longer he... Um, he goes on for before you can think before you can safely assume that Beatles songs are in the public domain. So that's something else. Another big question, and Kingston's touched on this, the fair dealing defences. So as Kingston explained, they're very specific. And I guess a few things to keep in mind. When you're going through that list, they are they are Australia's way of saying, yes, you can use the copyright of others, but only in a, only if you do so very carefully and for specific reasons. So probably the most common ones that pop up in film would be news, a fair dealing for the reporting of news, uh, satire and parody, satire or parody, I should say, or uh, criticism and review. So what I would say in the doco world is I'd, I'd make a few comments. For news reporting, there needs to be some immediacy to it. So you need to keep that in mind. And that's often what got, might, might be tough when it gets to to relying on that defence. So we're not just talking current affairs more broadly or topics of interest. We're talking fair dealing for the reporting of news. And you'd have to think about what that meant. Um, satire and parody. And satire is the reason lots of comedy, so lots of comedy on the ABC, you can think of shows such as Mad as Hell that would use clips or Gruen that would use clips. They are, in some in some cases at least, they'd be relying on a satire defence. Although I'd, make, I'd give you this warning. Satire has a very specific meaning. So um, what we tend to look at is the dictionary definition of satire, which is a commentary on vice or folly. I know it sounds a bit old fashioned, but what we're really saying is it can't just be for a joke. It can't just be for a gag. It has to be for some satirical purpose, some comment that you're actually making before you could use it. Um, and a lot of countries don't actually have the, an equivalent defence around the world. It's a very Aussie kind of thing to even have a satire and parody defence. But p perhaps the one that pops up the most in the documentary sphere in particular is criticism and review. So there is an ability, if, you can, if you're convinced it's a fair dealing for the purpose of criticism and review, to use things for free, you'd want to look at how much you use and you'd want to be very careful about it. And there's usually some rules around acknowledging who owns the copyright as well. So that's it in a ve very much in a nutshell. A few other things that pop up, um, so you can ask the questions and I'm not just lecturing you. Uh, that is, a, again, a temptation that lawyers have. So I'm waiting for someone to yawn just to give me a, a, subtle, a subtle hint. But um, I'll go to the, straight to the heart to a few things and you can ask some specific questions. Yes, you can use books and newspaper articles and various things to research documentaries as well. There's nothing wrong with that. Where it becomes an issue is if you start to take that one source and you're basically reproducing it in a different form and turning it into a documentary form. That is a substantial reproduction. So you may need to make a little bit of a judgment call about, is this just background text or background information that I'm using? There's no copyright protection in information per se. Um, but there is in the item, the work, the book that you want to use itself. I just might jump in. Of there. course, because um, that's something that's come up. That's come up recently. Right. With crime, there's a lot of people writing novels about true crime, 
which in as information, like if it's a like let's say the family court murders. I don't know if you know the family court murders, but um, where a number of uh, judges were blown up and yeah. killed, and yeah. during the during the eighties or I think it was the eighties. Um, now there's been a number of books written about that, and there's a heap of newspaper articles. So the, if you are making a documentary about that, what you would want to avoid is using one source, like one of those books, because if you did, you would need to get the copyright clearance from that author and that publisher. I'm asking you the qu to do that. I would imagine, but you could still make the documentary if you didn't. Would that be? Is that? Would that fit into that? So. <laughs> Typical lawyer answer, it depends. <laughs> um, it, it's a question of whether overall you are substantially rep reproducing the article that they've written. So it can become a bit of a fine line once you start to use a lot. And okay, you can tell me if you disagree, <laughs> but really once you start to use a lot and sort of one or more of a single source, what I would say to you, your risk of breaching copyright is going is getting higher each time you do it so and a lot of this is really risk risk management at the end of the day if you want to take the punt and not pay for something um sorry you about to i think you were about to say something oh, oh i was only i mean i don't have to i was, I was going to say also in relation to that um obviously i don't disagree with anything you've said um but uh in, in addition to that you would You've got the situation where if, if what you're doing is making a film that is really based on a single account of a real life event, um, you, you're probably looking at <clears throat> a situation where you, you would want to get um, the film rights for the book because turning a book into a film is, is an adaptation which is one of the rights that the copyright owner controls. And there's a difference between using the book as a resource to obtain information about the facts and actually turning that particular account of those facts into um, another form. And I, I gave some advice recently uh, in relation to um, a, a similar type of adaptation uh, of a particular biography of a very famous person um, and the the facts of this person's life were, are all well known, um, but there was one biography that presented the person's life in a particular way, and my client turned that into into another product. Um, but somebody else who had written a biography of the same person said, "Well, that's my you've you've used my book, but in fact, it it, it wasn't, and the the facts in both books were." identical because it's a person's life and they did the same things um, but it, but the way that it had been presented in this one book was something that was capable of being protected yeah so yeah so right. bas basically if you're going to go down that path you, you could do, avoid having to do any of those rights because you if it's a say it's newspaper I mean so it's in the public domain in terms of a story then you just you have to create your own way of telling that story I think that's really what I'm trying to get at is if you, as a, as a creator of copyright, if you're creating your version of the story, in fact, you're, if you're making a documentary, you're writing a book, aren't you, on, the, on that thing, that's what you want to do as a pope. But if you're going to follow the line, you know, Joe Smith was the, was the murderer of the judges, which is in book A, then clearly people are going to say, well, that is infringement because I came up with that idea. So I think that's, that's where that sort of crossover can happen, where you don't, you don't have to pay for any copyright if you come up with your own version of, of, or a view of the events that are publicly reported. I was particularly interested in uh, use of news and television yes. news. Yep. I, did I hear you say that it had to have some currency? Yeah. So I'm interested in historical use. Of it. No. So the, the 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 terms of the Copyright Act. So they've got these fair dealing defences set out, and it's fairly specific. It says a fair dealing for the reporting of news. Full stop. So the general uh, the the general understanding and what courts have spoken about is that well that is a reporting for news. That's the purpose that you might have the defence for. So. So not, we're not talking historical news. The interpretation being put on it is that we're talking current. Yeah, that's exactly right. Currency, current news, when news is news. So what you might even see, um, if you wanted to drill down on if you look at what some media organisations do, let's say that there was some juicy footage going around of you know, celebrities fighting or whatever, or whatever it might be, something. But they're using 
footage that someone else has taken. And it might be footage that someone wants to sell and, and get some commercial benefit from. What a media organisation might do is have it online for, say, seven days or so. Um, so they're relying on the fair dealing for the reporting of news defence because they're saying, I think we can get away with this because it's news. But maybe at around day seven, day eight, it's not news anymore and it'll disappear offline. And, and you get that a lot in the context of the Olympics because yeah. it's one of the most protected properties ever in the world and uh, all the media outlets that... Um, that don't have the rights to broadcast the Olympics want to broadcast bits of it. Uh, and there's a real issue um, about how much of someone else's broadcast they can take, um, whether that's, uh, an, you know, and, and at what point might the non-partnered uh, networks uh, broadcast of the medal ceremonies stop people from watching yeah. the, yeah. the uh, official broadcast partner. You got another one? So use, use of um, the news reader and the news that they're reporting in a historical context, in other words, uh, you know, years later, do I have to get clearance from, say, SBS or ABC for using that and separate clearance somehow for the vision that they have used as part of their news reporting? Yes, and probably for the second bit as well. <laughs> unless it's criticism. In, in, yeah, yeah, unless it fits into another defence, as Kate was just saying. Criticism, and it may, it may fall under criticism and review. Right. So, so for the news reporting one, yeah, you're probably on, it's probably going to be tough to say it's news, except unless, say, what if some, unless something has happened today, I don't even know what the date is because <laughs> it's been a busy few days. Whatever the date is today, 2018, unless there's some absolute relevance to what happened in the past to the thing happening today maybe you can you can take a take a punt that there's a fair dealing for the reporting news but it's a it's a tough I, I, one i don't think a film kate says I, no so i, I, think, I, I, think I would take care of you over <laughs> I, 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 I think it would be the media too long i think i, I think so. it would be very well you act for news yeah. organizations news, that's right <laughs> um but I, I i think that uh a filmmaker would find it very difficult to rely on the Film. the news Absolutely. reporting defence because a film by its nature is more permanent um, and isn't going to be reporting on news. It's not, it's not going to, it, it's going to last longer than that thing is news. But criticism and review, if for example, um, uh, I, I mean an, an example of re the reporting news defence would be uh, a lot of the discussion at the moment about gun control. There's been a lot of rehashing of the um, uh, of newspaper article, not rehashing, reproduction of newspaper articles and broadcast uh, footage from uh, Port Arthur. And all of that would be <clears throat> exempted under the news reporting if it's a news reporting uh, entity that is, is saying, we're reporting about the gun debate now and look back at what happened But if you were then. making the documentary, massacres in Australia's in the 20th century, <laughs> yeah. and you wanted to put in the Port Arthur as one of your stories, then you need permission to use the footage from, say, Channel 9 or whoever may have... You would need permission to use it. You couldn't just use it willy-nilly. It no, actually I, I requires... If what you were doing was making a film that was analysing the media treatment of massacres, right. then that might be criticism and review. So it, and I think the, the bottom line is if there's – you can see the, the murky – why we wanted to have this seminar <laughs> and talk about this is there's a lot of murky areas. It's not clear cut. I keep pointing to Naomi in the front here. Naomi's a researcher – sorry, Naomi, to throw you in the middle – who does this on a daily basis. She, she works on shows like 20 to 1 where they're – no, oh, well, you did work on it, right? And, and where, where they're pulling footage from all over the shop to put into a particular show, obviously not necessarily a documentary, but – the point is, she deals with it every day. She's a very good resource if you want to grab some. Grab, you need someone for research it. She's a woman, um, but she has to deal with this around the world every day, and and so, at the end of the day, you really do need to get advice. I mean, I, I can't emphasise that enough. We just see so many people not getting advice, falling in the deep end, and then screaming, "Help, get me out!" But it's too late. Um, so really, that's that's incredibly important. I won't. I'll keep saying that. You'll get bored hearing me say that because. 
you, you, it's, it, I've seen too many people falling in the deep end with this. Anyway, sorry, back to you. I'll, and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up so we can have more questions. But I think the other, the other main, I guess, issue that we help filmmakers with in this area, and this goes for, and it's really more in the contractual sphere, but whether or not, when you have made that decision, okay, I need to get clearance for this. I need to get a license. I need to get permission. Or you might want to sell something you've got. You might want to give someone permission. Then the question becomes, well, what rights have you actually bought or have you actually sold? And that's just a caution I'd put out there. So that's where you need to be really careful about what goes in any contract or in any discussion you have with someone when that permission is given. So, for example, you might think... Um, all right, it's pretty clear. I've bought permission. I've got permission to use 30 seconds of this clip. Do you definitely have permission or can it, do you have permission to on sell it to cinema? Um, what's the word? Cinema operators. Um, can you use it for promo purposes? Um, can you put it online? Um, or are there actual restrictions in your arrangement that might stop you doing that? So I won't go through all the possibilities here other than to say if you are getting permission, and as I said, the same goes as far as you protecting it as well, you've got to be really, really, really careful about what rights you're actually buying because that is something that can take you by surprise. And for a filmmaker, I would hate to see you put all of this work in it, into it. Um, maybe you're all okay for, say, one film festival, but it would be awful if you were then restricted from using it in another way because you miss something at that that early stage. I think that's probably the last yeah, sort of the, major the, issue I'd say as a, as a general case. And the audience will know that if you go to the ABC archive and you buy a bit of footage, you're going to be asked, what are, where is it being seen? Because if, it's an, if you want worldwide rights, it's different to wanting Australian rights. Yep, so, I mean, they're, they're, they're some of the things you need to think about when you're when you're buy, if you're going to get footage from things. And then sometimes it's weird, like we got some footage that was shot in the 1950s of Aboriginal stock hands shot on 16 millimeter color in 1947. Nobody owns it. They don't know where it came from, the National Film and Sound Archive. And so you get the license, but with the provision that you take the risk if someone turns up. Because they don't, because it's orphan, it's orphan works. It's works that don't have any, you know, amazing footage of colour that you've never, amazing footage from 1947. Some profession, some guy from a farm hired a professional filmmaker to come up and shoot for four months in there. Yeah, extraordinary stuff. There's a lot of those treasures around as well that you can get. So, and then, and it didn't cost anything. So it was great. Okay, thank you very much, Grant. No I think worries. that sort of gives you a bit of an overview. Yeah, so I make historical documentaries. So there's, always lots of trickery. Um, I'm making one at the moment about an artist who's deceased and who's not overly famous. And I tracked down the next of kin, which many other people didn't know existed, and believe them to be the rightful owners. Um, they don't really know that. People have been stealing the works and using them for years. And there's another guy who, whose father published a book who's been claiming ownership of the work. So how do I sort this out? How do I, before the release of my film, you know, get it all proper? Kate, we're almost looking at you, Kate. <laughs> I, um, so there's a few things you could do. Uh, Copyright Agency is a collecting society that has recently um, taken over the Visual Artists Collecting Society, which has got, which was called VisCopy, but is now just part of Copyright Agency, uh, they have um, people who are expert in handling visual the estates of visual artists, and so uh, if they they're unlikely to be able to um, grant you a license, but they might be able to, depending on whether the artist was a member of VisCopy, um, but they might be able to point you in the direction of a definitive answer about next of kin. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as, a, as a practical matter, um, I would say if you have tracked down a person who's the next of kin and you've obtained permission from that person, uh, the damages that would be awarded against you if you were if there was actually a different copyright owner 
are likely to be relatively minimal because you would have done you'd, you'd be an innocent infringer. Um, so uh, under under the Act, if you are if you're really innocent, uh, you didn't know that it was an infringement, and you didn't you shouldn't reasonably have known that it was an infringement. Um, then the damages are limited to an account of profits, uh, which unfortunately is often not very much. <laughs> um, so those are two sort of practical suggestions that that I would I would offer. The other thing too, obviously, is you know any filmmaker in this audience, if you're making a documentary, you need to have errors and omissions insurance, and that protects you against those sorts of <laughs> litigations where you innocently have, believe you have you know, got the copyright clearances and then discover that, you know, someone didn't own it and they were just, you know, bullshitting you. Um, and then someone else sues you. And so it's, it, that's, that's also, there's obviously protections for filmmakers that you need to have in place. I mean, um, they're sort of, that's sort of 101 documentary filmmaking. Um, you see in a lot of books these days, there's a, um, a notice, particularly books published in the UK, uh, that says, Every effort has been made, you know, any third party material that's been published, we've made every effort to contact the rights holder. But if you think you control something in here and we haven't contacted you, please contact us and we'll sort it out for the next reprint. All of those things are steps that people take to minimise their damages if they've inadvertently infringed. Hi, so with the footage or images that you don't know what the, where the copyright is, like what do you call them? Um, orphan works. Orphan works. Um, what are the risks in um, putting something in your documentary or film, I mean, obviously it varies as to what it is, but like, it seems like quite a risky thing to do, put something in that you don't have the copyright for if someone comes forward and, you know, does the emissions insurance cover you in that? Well, it, it, I mean, you might be able to help me with this one. It does cover you if you've made every effort yes. and you, I mean, because when you take out that insurance, the, I mean, the insurance body actually looks at what you're doing. So, so they're saying, ah, oh, well, you're making, a, you're making a film about Arthur Boyd. We are, can we see all the clearances for the Arthur Boyd paintings? They're going to ask you that question. Um, so when there's obvious stuff, they're going to ask the questions, have you got the clearances for those? And if you don't, they're going to say, well, we're not going to insure you. So that's will give you an answer pretty quickly um, on that because that'll, if they're asking questions and you don't have the answers to it, they will make a judgment based on that. So they're, in a way, they're like an arbiter of that, that question. So um, as I said with the documentary I was talking about, we actually, no one owned it. There was no track. We, all we had to do was pay f to get the footage out of the NFSA. But there was no ownership of that. And, and we didn't have any problems with our insurance because that, the NFSA said there is no ownership. We have no record of an owner. So if you can show that, then, it's, it's, then you don't have any problems, I think. It's, but, it, but the errors and omission will, I mean, I know people who've tried to take errors and omissions as insurance and the insurer said, we will not insure you. You do not have the rights to use this, or it's it's or the answers you're giving us are not, are not satisfactory. So that will tell you something. I mean, not everyone takes out errors, does all that. You may not be making a, a documentary at that level, as well. So you've got that's another thing you've got to consider where it's going to go. Is that would that be? Look, it's been a while since I made a documentary, so uh, this may be rusty knowledge, but yes. You only get an insurer to insure you for errors and omissions unless you can show that you've taken reasonable steps to track down the owners. Um, and you also won't be able to sell it to a network if you haven't got either an errors and omissions policy or proof that you've actually made reasonable attempts to track down the owners. Um, in the case where somebody claims to be an owner of something, you should have some sort of agreement where they actually sign to say that they are the... or they that they take responsibility for being the, the owner and then you have some reasonable tracking paperwork to show that somebody says they're the owner. But again, if you haven't done your homework, I think you're probably in, in trouble. I'm new to this business, so this might be a silly question, but when do you get the um, emission, the error and emissions um, insurance? Is it after you've completed your project? Yeah. It, come, it comes, um, well, it depends. It's changing. Um, it used to be, and again, I take advice from there's a number of experienced documentary filmmakers in the audience. It used to be just at the end of the shoot before you start cutting. We're getting the situation now where people are asking you to take out the assurance before you start making the film, which I find really weird 
because how are you supposed to ensure something that you haven't shot when you don't know what's in or not? So it's, it's to do with some cases that have happened recently. Um, the recent documentary uh, 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 Rebecca Barry produced, um, I think we did a session on this some time ago, um, where the, obviously one of the participants changed their story and sued the production. Um, and that's caused a lot of scares, I think, in the insurance industry about, well, maybe you have to come and know. So it is a bit of a movable feast at the moment, but normally, and again, please correct me, and there's a lot of experienced filmmakers in this audience, it usually comes after you've shot the film because that's when you can make the assessment. Because mm -hmm. if you've got stuff in there that's, well, I'll say, have you got the Arthur Boyd clearance on that, whatever, that's the, they can ask that question. But if they haven't got anything to watch, what are they asking? How are they assessing it? Does that, does that answer it? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Okay. And this, I was just going to say, this doesn't help you now, but the Department of Communication and the Arts are conducting a review this year and looking at all sorts of things, including orphan war works. So that is an area where there may be, I won't promise, but maybe tightening up of protections for people such as yourself as long as set criteria. I, I won't guess what they are now other than keep coming to a session like this um, every year or two and you might get you might get a better answer because it's particularly a problem in an, in the online world is actually yeah, where the law is coming from because how, how so, so what's happening there yeah. is that the collecting societies and some of the the the, um, the libraries and the the archival is, orphan works are obviously a huge um, problem for uh, museums and and galleries and um, and archivists and and so they're they're working on really practical solutions that will protect people who genuinely can't find a copyright owner. And it'll, it'll all be, it, I imagine, it will be related to the level of risk. So the older something is, the less risk there is. Um, if, if it's just a, a big problem, so there's not a lot of orphan works that are music because music is really well tracked. Um, there's a lot of photographs that are but that people claim to be orphan works, but with not very much effort, you can find out who actually owns it. It's sort of, so it really depends on the type of work as well. Let's do it. So it is a very different direction to, to some extent to copyright, but of course you own the IP in your work and the IP in your work is potentially your livelihood both now and in the future. So I'm going to talk a bit about piracy. Creative Content Australia is an organisation funded by industry organisations and companies like Foxtel and uh, the Motion Picture Distributors Association. Writers Guild, Directors Guild, SPA, etc., to try and raise awareness about the impact that uh, content theft has on the creative industries. So, um, piracy is really distribution. Uh, it is um, distribution that the creators don't get paid for. That's the only problem. So, as you can see, 191 billion visits to piracy websites in uh, 2016 is not going to be something that doesn't have an effect on the bottom line of the industry generally. And of course, just saying watch movies online in Google brings up pretty much 
0.9% uh, pirate sites. So it is very prevalent and um, something you need to think about. Here's some very recent stats about piracy activity in Australia. Uh, in February, so um, this is just in Australia, those figures are, are terrifying, um, and I'm, I'm not going to go through them one by one, but you can kind of get a, a sense of them. And also what's most interesting is that the most pirated films in Australia in the week commencing 22nd of February were those three films, all of which were available online at that stage. So it is not always um, as many people think about availability. So let's just look briefly at some stats around piracy. Who are these active pirates? Well, 21% teens and 21% of adults are still active um, pirates. And as you can see, that uh, 16 to 34-year-old age group is particularly prevalent. Um, these are stats from late 2017. Creative Content Australia undertakes research every year to kind of find out what the incidence and frequency of piracy is. So why do people do it? Well, because it's free, you know, hence the most commonly asked question grant of can I use it for free? Uh, this is why people pirate. Generally, they pirate because it's free, you know, and then there are other reasons or excuses that people give um, amongst them what they want to watch is not available or it's what everyone else does or nobody's stopping them. Um, but free is the, is the driver for most piracy. Um, the campaign that you just watched, we produced uh, earlier this year, Say No to Piracy. It's another function of, of creative content. Um, and uh, it's available on our website, as long as long with, along with some banners, etc. And we urge you to, to write to us and, and uh, use it wherever you like and, and raise awareness about the ordinary people in our industry who are, who, whose careers and livelihoods are affected by piracy. We also produced uh, last year the price of piracy based on the back of the site blocking legislation with Brian Brown talking about the fact that site blocking had taken out a number of, of pirate sites um, and what was left on the internet were proxies and mirrors, many of which um, are a major way of propagating malware, ransomware, etc., and were dangerous places to be. Uh, site blocking in itself, very briefly, is very... Uh, the Australian Federal Court ordered the blocking of 59 sites in August and um, some research was undertaken this year, Incopro site blocking research, which shows a major reduction in piracy overall and a 53% reduction in the use um, of the pirate sites subject to a blocking order. So um, we know from many international re uh, studies that piracy is significantly reduced, but only when a substantial number of, of um, sites are blocked. Um, from CCA's own research, we know that uh, pirates predominantly have experienced um, uh, blocks uh, as, they, as they search. But what happens next is the most important thing. So generally, people are going and looking for another source of illegal content. Um, hence the need to tighten up legislation and to make sure that what we call the back door to piracy is closed. So Google and the search engines really do facilitate piracy by making sure that as soon as a site is blocked, you can easily find um, a proxy or mirror site. So just typing the words PIR into a Google search will pretty much bring up a number of, of proxy and mirror sites, for example, to the Pirate Bay. Um, and once again, just looking, if you want to watch a film online, it'll only give you very few, if any, legal sources, and generally it will provide you with a number of illegal sources. So um, search engines such as Google are really the dominant drivers of piracy right now and um, an important target for new legislation, which we are pushing for in 2018. Um, updating you on the next threat, just in case you thought piracy was about to disappear, set-top boxes are uh, growing in their usage both in Australia and around the world. So they're things like Kodi boxes, they're perfectly legal devices, but provide access to apps, infringing apps, which basically scrape pirate sites on the internet to provide you with pretty much any content. Movies, TV shows, sports, all language, um, films. And we found in our 2017 research that Australians, 31% um, of Australians are using set-top boxes, but one in four teens and one in five adults are actually using infringing apps on their um, boxes. And 
The problem with this is because they can find an unauthorised copy of the film, many people are either spending less money in cinema or buying less Blu-rays Blu or DVDs or, SV or, or paying for content. And in fact, many of the providers of what they're calling fully loaded Kodi boxes with the apps already on them advertise them. You just have to go to eBay or any, you know, uh, um, any of the online retailers and you will find them selling boxes and suggesting that people can cut all of their cables, ties and all of their subscriptions and get content for nothing. And because people are often paying for the boxes, um, they think it's a legitimate means of watching content. So it really is a, a big problem. And of course, they're easy to find, cheap and uh, fully loaded, and they look incredibly professional. Those are some sc screenshots from from some of the apps that you can get, and as you can see, they just look like any legitimate content site. Um, so um, does it have bad news? Yes, it affects you, it affects documentary makers. I'm afraid I didn't have time to do some updated stats, but um, this is from late last year. These films were released some time ago, but they are still being um, streamed and downloaded in huge numbers online. Austra many Australian documentaries lose a lot of income to this. And the problem with piracy is not simply the back-end revenue, because we know many filmmakers are not the beneficiaries of the financial success of either feature films or documentaries, but... Um, Piracy really does undermine investment in the film industry. Why would investors, you know, and a lot of filmmakers anecdotally say that they're being asked by investors, particularly for certain genres, yeah. how they're going to protect against piracy because investors are reluctant to put their money into films that may um, be illegally downloaded. So that's the bad news. Um, this is something you need to take um, note of. But the good news is that there is the highest agreement ever in Australia that piracy is stealing and theft, not that people actually acknowledge their behaviour has any impact on the industry, but last year we saw 74% of Australians saying that um, piracy is stealing and theft and agreeing to that. So um, that's pretty much a quick snapshot of um, of what's happening in, in, in the world of, of content um, theft online, content theft in Australia, which affects both film and television, documentary and feature, and um, is very seldom about, the, about price and availability and usually about free and convenience. Um, convenience being that all source, all material or all content is in one source, which of course it is if you don't have to license content, it's very easy to make it available from one location, whereas for legitimate services, obviously, they can't have everything because of exclusive deals and just simply because of the cost of licensing every piece of content. So um, don't let people talk to you about convenience or price or um, availability. They are often just excuses um, for piracy. So um, a great quote from a writer who talks about the marginalization, economic marginalization of content creators who witness the decimation of their of their income because of this sort of permissionless innovation that justifies the theft of, of, of their content online. How, as a filmmaker, I suppose, as a producer <coughs> or director, do you have any recourse? Uh, like, how do you protect yourself from these? Obviously, the, the piracy companies are, are quite big, and uh, how, can you, how do you get them closed down? Or is that something that the distributor has to look <laughs> after or like is there any recourse for a producer or director to do anything about it or not really? It is very difficult and of course um, with streaming sites it is slightly easier because you can actually identify the source and you can write to it but most of the pirate sites like Pirate Bay are offshore and they're cloud-based services and they move from one location to another. Um, so there's very little you can do. You can't find them. You can't contact them. Um, mm. If it's on um, s platforms like YouTube, uh, you can write to them, but you have to prove that you're the rights holder before they'll take it down, and it is a bit of a process, and it is a bit of a whack-a-mole process because mm. for popular films especially, as soon as they go up, you know, as soon as they come down, another source puts them up. Um, 
I truly believe that there are two ways to, to deal with the piracy problem. One is legislation, um, and you all need to support strong legislation, copyright legislation, and there are various um, reviews occasionally and proposals, and uh, your voice is of a very important part in that debate. And education, um, which pretty much mm. can start in your own homes. I can't, you know, if I, I would be rich if I had a dollar for every time somebody tells me about their kids' bad habits, even though they themselves make their living from um, creating screen content. So um, you need to start with your friends and family and be an advocate and a soldier for strong copyright protection. Mm. Explain to people why there is a real problem. It's not a victimless crime. It has a genuine impact on our industry and our livelihoods, and it's a global industry. <clears throat> so it's not just about Hollywood films, and it's certainly not just about rich Hollywood stars. It's about all of those people that you see in the, mm. you know, in that uh, campaign. Less jobs, less films made, less jobs for people like yourself. So, mm. unfortunately, I'd love to tell you that there's actions that independent filmmakers could take to keep getting their films offline. But it's just simply mm. not true. Okay. Um, you, you need to fight for strong copyright protection and just hope that education and a kind of... Not, not a sense of morality, because it is hard to point fingers at people who do this, but um, just a, a, a sense of understanding about a, a genuine impact on the creative industries. Mm. I, th I think in light of what's gone before, uh, what I would like to talk about briefly is uh, my experience of copyright licensing um, and how that works in practice. Um, and then I would like to talk about the, a little bit about the fair use debate in Australia because I know that a lot of people have been uh, saying things about the documentary filmmaking business in particular um, in relation to the relative merits of the existing system of fair dealing and the American system of fair use. And I think that there's a bit of misinformation out there. Um, and uh, so further to the idea of having strong legislation um, and remembering why we've got uh, the protections that we do have in this country, um, it, m it might be worthwhile to just have a, have a bit of a look at that American system and whether it would deliver the results that people say it would. Um, so, so first of all, uh, in terms of the, my, my experience of the practice of copyright, um, it, my, my focus has always been on ensuring that copyright owners get paid. Um, that is what most of my clients do. Uh, so I act for a lot of collecting societies and their business is the, a business of licensing um, and it's particularly a business of licensing um, the, the, the types of uses that most copyright owners wouldn't be capable of licensing themselves. So uh, multiple uses um, in schools, um, uh, video on demand services, um, content platforms like Google, uh, and uh, th those sorts of transactions where it would be literally impossible for the uh, platform to get licenses from all the relevant copyright owners and it would also be impossible for every individual copyright owner to negotiate a, a proper license. Um, and so collecting societies exist to ensure that creators get paid. Um, and most creators in Australia have got access to a collecting society who will, um, will push revenue through. Uh, as a result of the licensing activities that they engage in. Um, I do also act for a lot of um, publishers, both music publishers and book publishers, and I'll talk a bit about their licensing practices, their clearance practices, because one of the myths uh, that is being um, promulgated uh, by, by various parties in, in the copyright debates, which have also been described as the copyright wars, and it is a very political environment and it's it's quite acrimonious at times. Um, uh, one of the myths is that uh, there, there are these these middle people who uh, take all the money for themselves, aren't themselves creators and they don't pay uh, the rights the, the, the authors. I'll, I'll use the word author loosely to mean any creator. Uh, in my experience that is simply not true. 
Um, there are a lot of advantages to having distributors, um, producers, uh, record labels, book publishers, music publishers. Uh, there's a, a lot of creative advantages um, and, and also uh, a lot of people who pay money for rights. So filmmakers, for example, who pay money for music, they pay to a music publisher and they say, well, I'm really, I, I don't believe the money gets back to the composer. At the moment, my observation would be that um, on average, probably about 80% of revenue that goes through a music publisher is returned to uh, an author. So uh, people are concerned about where the money goes. Where the money goes is to individual creators, by and large. Um, so if, uh, if, if you look at if, if, I, if I'm advising somebody in relation to uh, the, the type of creator like yourselves who might use other people's work or want to use other people's work, the first point would probably be to query whether you can access that work um, under an exception that's contained in our copyright legislation. The reason that you would do that rather than go straight to the copyright owner to see if you could get a licence is that quite naturally uh, it would be quite unusual for um, a copyright owner to say, I, I think you can probably use a fair, rely on a fair dealing exception for that. Um, not because they are evil in any way, but just because if you go to them for a licence, they're going to give you a licence. So it's probably better to consider at the outset whether you can rely on an exception. And under our legislation, there's, there's numerous exceptions. They aren't just the fair dealing exceptions. Uh, there are there's a whole bunch of just straight up free exceptions where you don't even have to think about whether something's fair. Um, uh, we've we've referred to a few of them here today. You know, taking a photograph of a sculpture that's on permanent public exhibition. There, a lot of people criticise the Copyright Act for being um, a bit archaic and clumsy and complex, but uh, in my view, yes, it's it's a monstrous looking document, but. It's, if you are a person who uses copyright material, if you are a, um, a, you're a filmmaker or you're making news or you are writing a book, you want to know really specifically, you don't want to know just generally can I use stuff, you want to know I want a photograph of that sculpture. And so you would like the act to be as specific as possible or you're, you're filming something and there's a painting on the wall. You don't want to know, oh, do I have to think about whether it's fair? Do I have to weigh up all these fairness factors? It's really quite handy to have a section in the Act that says if you incidentally film an artistic work, as long as your film isn't about the artistic work, you can do that for nothing. Um, so I, I actually think that uh, although if you sit down and read it cover to cover, it's quite complex and dense and difficult, if you're looking for really specific, the answers to really specific questions, it's, it's actually quite approachable. I'm very fond of it. Um, <laughs> Can I ask you a question then? Where would you find these exceptions? Because you're actually saying they're specific. Where would you, what's the best place to get this information? Well, the, for best, these place, the best place would be the Copyright Council. Okay. Um, or there's a, a whole little cluster of, uh, of sections in the Act called Acts Not Constituting Infringement of Copyright. Um, so that's, uh, they're, they're sort of gathered around the 60s and 70s, um, so, uh, but the Copyright Council would be a really good place to go for that type of information. The other type of exception, or the, it's, there's three groups of exceptions, so there's the ones that are just completely, yep, you can do it. A lot of the technology specific ones are, not technology specific, but technology related, so your time shifting and your format shifting, uh, those sorts of exceptions, no fairness factors, no money changes hands. Then you've got your statutory licences or compulsory licences, which is where the government has said, you copyright owner, you can't stop people from using your work in various, um, for various public policy reasons. So for example, if you are a copyright owner, you cannot stop a school from using your material to teach, but you will get paid. And so there are... Um, massive blanket licensing arrangements between collecting societies and educational institutions throughout Australia whereby millions and mil tens of millions of dollars are paid every year and distributed to copyright owners for various educational uses of all sorts of materials. Um, 
And who could tell me who collects that money? <laughs> For $10? Mm -hmm. No one. Screen Rights. So Screen Rights collects that money. So Screen Rights... Um, manages, among other things, the statutory licence for um, op what, what someone as old as me still calls off-air taping um, in schools. Uh, and so nobody can stop a school from recording films for educational purposes, but you will get paid. And Screen Rights also has a product called Enhanced TV, which is designed to uh, help teachers find uh, film content um, and use it in an educational way and, and that helps direct uh, a lot of uh, educational institutions towards the, the sorts of material that you make. Uh, so, so that's a very useful organisation. Um, and then you've got the fair dealing exceptions which are specific exceptions um, as Kingston and, and Grant have both discussed and those are, there's, you have to have a specific purpose and then you have to consider whether the use is fair as well. Um, so it's it, just because you've used it for criticism and review doesn't necessarily mean that it's fair. And the Act sets out a bunch of factors that you would cons you would have regard to when you were thinking about whether or not something's fair. Uh, a, a crucial one would be the impact on the um, original on the copyright owner's market for the work. Um, and so is it fair for you to uh, effectively put a competing product into the market that will take away sales from the, from the original copyright owner? Probably not. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the American system towards the end. But so your, your first point would be, can I, can I use the material under one of those exceptions? Is there, is there maybe a, am I, am I a, a teacher and I want to tape something or I want to record, if, I'm, if, if you're making a film as part of, and you're also a teacher, um, there are lots of uh, licences in place, for example, to make um, recordings of things like the Rock of Stedford uh, as part of the educational activities of the institution. Um, and those are very specific to, for educational purposes, but a lot of those licences include the right, for example, to sell at a cost recovery price DVDs of, of those works to the school community. So uh, in, in some contexts there are some quite specific uh, licences that are in place. A there's a lot of, um, there's a statutory licence for government use of material and so if you make a film, if you work for the government and you oh, are contracted to the government to make a film of the police band, um, that is bound to be covered by, uh, by a licence that's administered by, um, in that case, APRA AMCOS. So, so there, are, there are all those sorts of licences in place or there's the fair dealing exceptions and so your first question when you want to use someone else's material is can I slot it into one of those uses before I start looking for a licence? I would imagine that the most likely fair dealing exception uh, if there's not a specific free exception, the most likely fair dealing uh, exception would be um, for documentary filmmakers would be criticism and review or parody and satire. Um, so y you would want to have a look at that. So you'd say, am I, re am I really reviewing or criticising that work, a as we discussed before in relation and to our hypothetical massacre example, um, and, uh, and then is it fair? Assume it's not, it doesn't come up within one of those exceptions. The types of licences that are available from, from copyright owners are also quite extensive. Uh, generally speaking, copyright owners will grant either licences for um, blanket use of all materials in a particular category or specific licences for particular uses. And I thought it might be helpful just to, particularly in the music context, talk about the types of things that people, that, that music copyright owners take into um, consideration when they're granting those sorts of licences. So I, I, I do a lot of work in music licensing um, and one of, the, uh, one of the things that people often want a licence for is uh, there's a, lo a lot of t um, programs that are made for television that uh, use a lot of music and people will come to the music publishers via their collecting society and say, can, can I just have, I don't know what we're going to use. I'm, I'm doing Australian Idol. 
I don't know what people are going to sing in the auditions. Can I have a blanket licence for that? I can't. I, 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 I've got no idea. There's 250 people are auditioning. I haven't got a clue. And so in, in those circumstances, sometimes, um, particularly if it's, for, if it's for television broadcast, for, for various legal reasons, uh, it's quite likely that a blanket licence will be available. Um, if you're using, if, if you're not using music like that, and, and that's all talking about where you're filming people performing music, not talking about putting a soundtrack into a film after, after you've made the film, um, specific uh, licences are available usually from music publishers. And the sorts of things that the music publishers are going to be interested in is where you want to distribute it. They might not control the rights overseas, for example. And so a lot of times what we see is you'll get a licence to put the music into um, a film for Australia, but if it's going to be distributed overseas, you have to strip the music out. So that happens with a lot of television programs, as I'm sure you know. And they, they will just strip the music out and put some production music into the soundtrack instead because the rights just can't be cleared or they're too expensive for overseas. Um, but the So they'll look at territory. They might look at the type of use. Sometimes these music licences will be really, really specific. So you'll, you'll get the licence to use a song, but you won't be allowed to... Um, you, you might not get the licence to use the sound recording, but you, uh, you can't make an, a re-recording that sounds anything like the original performer. There'll be all sorts of um, uh, conditions around, around the use. Some music publishers are still quite wary of uh, some types of distribution, so you're, there, are, there are still... And, and often this doesn't come from the music publisher. Sometimes it comes from the original songwriter. Most music publishers are contractually obliged to go back to the original, to the songwriter, and get permission for any any sort of use in film. Um, and so there are still, believe it or not, some songwriters in Australia who won't allow their work to be downloaded. There are um, some songwriters, not very many, it's about five, I can tell you who they are later, um, <laughs> who, who don't want their work to be used as um, ringtones. A lot of people don't like their work to be used as ringtones. Uh, so th there's a few little specific things, but those sorts of licences are available. Everything is going to be easier to negotiate before the music is in the film. Um, once the music is in the film, to a certain extent, the copyright owner has got you over a barrel a bit. Uh, I shouldn't have said that on the on the filming. Uh, not over a barrel. They they are totally entitled to um, to assert their rights. Uh, a license is always going to be easier to negotiate before you use the work. Uh, I have advised many people after the event, which is when you move from a licensing scenario into an infringement scenario. I've had lots and lots of filmmakers um, come to me and say, "I've I've made this film." Uh, I got all the rights, but there are these three songs in it that I now I can't get the rights. What am I going to do? The options are you go to the music, to the copyright owner and they will say it's going to cost you fifty thousand dollars. You say I can't afford fifty thousand dollars. I will take that song out of the film. Sometimes they'll say, of course you can have it, um, or sometimes you can negotiate a better deal. Uh, but if you if you don't and you go ahead with the production, you are looking at uh, possibly injunctions, possibly destroying all your copies of the film um, and, and possibly uh, a, and a damages situation. Usually in Australia, damages are going to be the uh, reasonable licence fee that would have been charged anyway. So you, you can see why you're obviously much better off going up front to get the to get the licence in the first place. Um, I did, I think we're getting close to time. I did want to talk very briefly about fair use. So as we've discussed, in Australia, we've got these specific fair dealing exceptions. In America, they have a, a provision of, of their copyright legislation that says that it just refers to fair use. Interestingly, the section, is, and so it's not an infringement of the copyright in a work uh, to, to if, if the use is a fair use. Interestingly, in that section, and, the, and this is held up, this provision is held up as being this great, flexible, fantastic, free exception that would solve all of the rights issues that 
people have. Um, the American provision refers to the specific purposes that we have set out in individual sections. They're only illustrative, but they are, they are there. And so uh, it is also relevant um, for, they don't have parody and satire. A lot of people think that's because they actually don't have parody or satire in America at all. Um, <laughs> but but they, they do still, <laughs> they, do, they do still have um, reporting news, for example, is one of the illustrative purposes in the provision. Uh, a lot is made in the American courts about, um, as Kingston said, about transformative use, which is, uh, that is, something is more likely to be a fair use if you have taken someone else's original work and turned it into something else, um, usually of some sort of artistic or other public merit. It is also important to remember that in America they have a constitutional right of freedom of speech, as Kingston also said, which uh, we don't have here. And so the whole American jurisprudence is quite different. When you read those American cases on fair use, though, uh, they're actually a lot more complex than they are sometimes presented here by the fair use advocates. So for a start, a lot of them aren't actually about fair use. A lot of them are um, very preliminary cases that are about whether or not an injunction can be granted. And so what you're getting is an indicative opinion of the court that fair use is arguable or not arguable. They're not Even some of the cases that are the most um, prominent cases on fair use don't contain findings about fair use. The, the cases are sent back down to lower courts, the, but the there's commentary around what might or might not be fair. But actually, the considerations that the courts take into account are very similar to what the courts look at under our fair dealing exceptions. Um, so in a lot of ways, there's not a lot of difference. And in particular, there's not a lot of certainty about it. Um, and even more particularly, in relation to films, there's not a lot of certainty. And so... There is a case that involved the use of about 15 seconds of um, John Lennon's Imagine in a documentary film, but the use of the work in that film was, uh, was the, the American courts would say transformative, but the, the work was used to make a particular point in the film, which was uh, that the film was saying... Um, uh, the film was contrasting what was happening in the film with the words, with the lyrics of the song, and they used the lyrics, and it was held to be a fair use. But I think that case probably would have held to in Australia to have been criticism or review. So I, I think when when you look at the way the American courts actually treat fair use uh, in in this creative context, generally speaking, I think a lot of the our fair dealing exceptions would probably come up with the same result. Um, there are other cases involving films uh, and the use of music in particular where it... And, and there's one case that involved the use of um, a whole bunch of footage of Elvis Presley, uh, and it was held that actually it wasn't a fair use um, because... It, this is in America. It wasn't a fair use because they just used too much of it and they weren't really doing it for one of the illustrative purposes in the fair use provision. They were really, It was really just entertaining and pretty cool footage, uh, and that's not fair. So... In a lot of the the actual cases, you end up with the same result that I think you would probably get here. It's certainly not the case that filmmakers in America do not pay for the use of third-party material in films uh, because of fair use. That, that, that is just not the case, uh, particularly in the case of music. Um, music li the music licensing industry is so well established uh, that it, it's quite difficult to go behind that and rely on a fair on a fair use exception. Um, my view about the fair use advocates in Australia is that actually um, a lot of a lot of the funding for the fair use arguments in Australia is coming from the big technology content platforms. And that's because their model relies on them taking people's material and distributing it for nothing and then relying on a takedown procedure if, uh, if somebody doesn't want to uh, have some kind of micropayment <coughs> from them for advertising that they put around the content. 
that's actually where a lot of the cases in America are heading at the moment to say that use by big tech companies uh, of, of third party copyright material um, is a fair use because the technology is innovative and fantastic and interesting. It's actually got nothing to do or very little to do with creative use of third party material because those cases generally are decided in the same way as our fair dealing cases are. So I think that if people are seduced by the fair use arguments, they would be minded to look at who is arguing the most for fair use. And in Australia, it is Google um, and it's the educational institutions. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to reduce their licence fees uh, that are ultimately paid to copyright owners. Um, and so I think that copyright owners who fall into the trap of arguing for fair use ultimately might find that they're shooting themselves in the foot because where the, the real advantages of fair use are going to be for, for big tech. That's my conspiracy theory for the night and I'll stop talking. <laughs> um, and, and why we should raise that is because it does concern every single one of you in this audience. I was at the Productivity Commission hearings about um, this very subject, they had one documentary filmmaker appear for these hearings, one. And this documentary filmmaker had made one film. And the evidence that they were throwing, fortunately I was glad I went, because they started throwing evidence at me and I said, who is this? And I knew who this person was and they'd made one film, it was a lovely film, it's worked really well. But the, the questions he was raising about the problems he had, I said, well I'm sorry, that's filmmaking 101. If they don't know how to deal with that, they shouldn't be making films because we've been everyone in the world has had to deal with those issues from day one and they weren't complicated issues. So it, it's concerning when a government is taking advice from one person with very little experience. Fortunately, we were able to counter that, but it, it, is, it will affect you. And our colleagues in New Zealand we're working with at the moment, they, are, they have a copyright review on right now and there's a big push for fair use and there's a counter push from the creators, particularly my colleagues at the New Zealand Directors Guild, to try and, I mean, they're pushing to get directors copyright, which would be amazing <laughs> for us. But it would mean places, and, and put up your hands if you get money from screen rights. Well, that's the first place you'd see the impact because that money would be reduced significantly. And so it's really important that that's, that, that you are part of the discussion because you're the people who are making the content. And if you're not part of the discussion, we're in real trouble because you need to actually be there when those questions are asked. And you need to look at this. I'm not telling you, to, telling you what to think. I'm telling you you need to look at it. You need to actually analyse it. You need to look at the facts and go, okay, who's... I mean, it, there, you know, the number of academics that have come through Australia in the last three years, every single one of them was funded by Google. Every single one. Why? <laughs> because it was really clear that they were pushing, pushing a particular angle. That's my viewpoint. It's not pushing it onto you. But you need to look at that and say, well, what system do we want? Not what We don't want someone else's system foisted upon us. Not even the Myanmar system. Um, we want the system that works for us. So we need to have the input. So creators need to have the input. And it's sometimes, as you know, very difficult to energise people who are too busy making stuff <laughs> to actually get involved in the political discussions. And, you know, that's where the Copyright Council and Directors Guild and the Writers Guild and all those people obviously have a role. But at the end of the day, you're the ones who are going to bear the brunt of whatever decisions are made. So it is an important one to think about. Um, and... Technology has changed everything. We know that. It's not just changing in the, in the way um, we're losing networks and we're getting streaming services. It's changing the way all of our content is distributed and how you as a content creator will or won't get paid, which is the bottom line here for everybody. But the other part of that, it's also about who controls what your content does. And I made that example earlier uh, about a filmmaker whose work was going to be used in a way that was counter to what she was actually created the work for. So it's also about not just the money, it's about having reasonable control of your work and the purpose of that work being adhered to by whoever you decide to let them use it. So it, it's, it's important to think about these things, it's important to dis discuss them, that's why we had this session. I'm going to actually... Can oh, I, sorry. Yep, I jump wanted in. to say something about Google. Not to demonise Google too much tonight, but you have to be aware that Google 
relies on eyeballs, on free content. There is absolutely, they want as much content as possible, which brings as many people as possible because they increase their revenue from the, the amount of people who come to their platform. But there is no incentive for them to pay for content. So, you know, all of the stuff that you hear about Google being a major player behind a number of organizations in Australia, you'd be amazed how much money they're pushing through various organizations who are who are promoting fair use and a whole lot of other, um, you know, you know, they're not interested in site blocking and they're worried that it will extend to, to search engines, etc. But just be, be cautious that they are, you know, there is no benefit for them to hand out money to, to content, uh, to rights holders for the content that they make. And I just, do you mind if I do a quick plug of Content Cafe? So Creative Content Australia runs an online um, uh, portal. portal for copyright news called Content Cafe. It's at contentcafe.org.au and it's a... It's a great place to just get general information about fair use and safe harbour and copyright generally and what's going on in piracy. And we collate and collect and link to a number of articles, both globally and locally, and we actually commission articles to be written for us about local issues. We also highlight, you know, filmmakers and the work that they do. Um, so please, please go and you can subscribe. We won't inundate you with too much information. We send you a monthly um, update on some of the new articles that we've put up, but you can look at it every day. We're virtually putting up articles every few days. So please go to contentcafe.org.au. If, if I could also say, in the interest of not demonising Google, um, <laughs> that uh, in Australia, uh, well, throughout the world, Google does have um, contractual relationships with copyright owners uh, and it's, it's it has blanket licences in place certainly for the use of music on the Australian service um, but it also has direct licensing arrangements with a lot of music publishers, a lot of record labels, a lot of film distributors um, but one of the reasons why those licences can be entered into not just with Google but with other content platforms in Australia is that they can't rely on uh, waffly exceptions like fair use because we do have a strong copyright regime and there is, there is an incentive for them not to infringe. So I have two questions, um, sort of more related to the earlier uh, question of can I use it for free? Well, uh, I'll give you the full context. So I've been a part of a production uh, on another country, on Indonesia, uh, and we're using a, yeah we required uh, we required to use uh, a clip from the ABC one of uh, the news sources that we use and the thing is we're planning to make this documentary for free for a free release so does that like mitigate or reduce the clearance fee at all uh, in regarding to uh, news coverage from the 1990s or like do do I have to pay as well, and how much would it be? The, the fact well, I, I, how much would it be is uh, not, a, not a question that I could answer. Um, the fact that you want to distribute it for nothing isn't going to make a difference to the legal answer to that question under Australian law. I don't know about under Indonesian law. Um, but... Uh, Sometimes when people are making a, um, a, a product, whatever it is, whether it's an event or whether it's a film, or, uh, and they're doing it and everybody is contributing their work for nothing, uh, sometimes a copyright owner will also say that they'll contribute their work, particularly if it's for a, uh, a charitable purpose or, you know, lots of copyright owners will do that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, sometimes people will grant the licence in return for a particular credit or, or, or some other form of um, uh, consideration. But the fact that it's being distributed freely isn't going to make a legal difference. So in, in the same... Similarly, if the fact that you're 
releasing something commercially doesn't make much of a difference either. So uh, if something is a fair dealing, then it's going to be a fair dealing if it's a commercially released theatrical production or if it's a thing that's going to be shown free at a festival. Um, so the the fairness, one of the fairness factors will be the impact on the market for the copyright owner. Um, but basically the use, if the use is falls within one of the fair use categories, fair dealing categories in Australia, under then under Australian law, that would be a fair dealing. But but yeah, the fact that you're not making any money out of it isn't going to make difference. Mm, yeah. So what about the uh, exception for criticism? Yeah. Because uh, in that context, do I, do I have to only criticize the media organization's coverage or can I also criticize the subject of what they're covering? Because that's what we're doing. Under Australian law, it's uh, criticism of that work or another work. So you couldn't use it to criticize um, a social policy, but you, you do have to be criticising either that work or another work. And I, I do um, a lot of work in this area for book publishers because there's a lot of... At the moment, there's a, a fashion for um, uh, books that are compilations of things, you know, lists and that, that type, sort of publications that have arisen out of the fad for lists. And it, you have to go through it. It's fantastic from a legal perspective because as I said before I charge a lot of money and um, you sit there for hours going through the book and you, you do it's everyone and you know that cereal packet yes you're criticizing the artistic work that is that cereal packet that picture of El McPherson no that is just for entertainment value and so that'll be a fair dealing and that won't I did have someone once a newspaper publisher um, put a great big photograph of an L McPherson calendar, you know, on page, say, three, and um, and say that they were reporting the news that she had released the calendar. But no. It <laughs> <laughs> it's not too fair. No. I mean, it's, it's also important then if you're in doubt. It's, I know if you haven't got any money, you can get free legal advice. You can come to the Copyright Council. They'll, they can help you out. There's, there's ask law. So there is ways of, of getting that answer in more detail because it's more specific. Um, and yes, quite rightly, there are agencies who will say, "Okay, we'll give it to you for free." You know, the, if it's an ABC story and the and the documentary, you know, they don't often do that, but uh, <laughs> but you never know. It, and and the thing is, you should ask because it worst can happen is they say no. Um, but if you put a good case, you may get a situation where they'll go, "Oh yeah, fair enough. It's it's they're doing this. They're not getting any money. It's clearly a good cause." Make sure you just credit that it came from the ABC archive. So I, I would advise you to do that for sure. Okay, and next question. I had another question about the fair dealing exemptions, probably a bit particular, but just with um, satire and parody, I'm wondering like, obviously you see it a lot in the news where they'll have a picture from the news and they'll be satirising or parodying those people. I'm just wondering about the other kind of pictures that they lose. Let's say they say Barnaby's getting round like Fred and Ginger and they use a bit from Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers. Like that other part, is that copyright exempt and um, sort of all location pictures or corporate videos in that context? Like kind of how far can you go with parody and satire and the use of copyright material? And also in a work that's not substantially satire and parody but just perhaps a documentary, but at one point you have satire and parody. Can you use it then? I'll, I'll start we're first time. Yeah, we're, try we're actually trying to be polite to each other because we haven't been working with each other long enough. So we're like, you know, oh, no, you please. Oh, no. Let's start with totally want it. Let's start with your sec second question first because that, that is an important one and I've heard, it I've, I've heard that argument put, put a lot. Um, that oh well I've got a I'm running a I, I'm I'm producing a satirical piece so isn't that all okay so the answer is no so you've got to what you need to do was look at the individual works of others that you want to use and look at the purpose you're using each of those works a little bit like the Kate talking about the is the serial packet might be yes the McPherson picture might be no you don't want to just take a broad view and go it's just a satirical piece that's okay you've got to look at each individual item because um, I've been up so early I can't even remember the first question so that's a good reason for me to go to Kate if she <laughs> yeah. can remember what the first question was <laughs> has something to do with copyright I know yes that. yes um <laughs> no I'm not I've, 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 I've been thinking about Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers oh 
Um, how, how far you want to know? So how far you can go? Well, it's yeah, it's right. the, the fact that so the fact that the material itself wasn't originally satirical doesn't doesn't matter. The the question is what's the purpose of the use, and and usually in my experience, you you can sort of you, you can sort of tell. So um, if for example that segment on insiders on Sunday morning where Hugh Parkinson does um, a, a mashup of a whole lot of uh, um, popular culture things with politicians' heads superimposed on them. Um, I, I would say, I would imagine, I don't know, uh, but I would imagine that that is absolutely just totally parody and satire. And um, and I don't think permission, it, it's, and I also think it's fair. Uh, if if it sounds to like I, I think in a story about Barnaby Joyce probably would you'd have to look at it but in a story about Barnaby Joyce he's getting around like you know Fred and Ginger he's a bit of Fred and it sounds to me like it's more just entertaining rather than actual parody and satire but if you're if you are actually doing a piece that is satirizing um, society and politicians current behavior and you use a clip from a movie where somebody says something sort of vaguely relevant and funny, that may well be parody and satire. So back to Grant's original, it depends. Um, and it is, and I, I found, I mean, particularly with ABC and other media clients, that that's the question because there is a bit of a there is a bit of a confusion between is it funny, is it a joke, or is it satire? Um, just because you can come up with a good argument as to why it could be satire on some sort of, you know, academic, high-level high, high level plane. Um, once you're kind of getting into that, I could argue it at satire, you really want to know, look, is there a point to it? What's the comment being made versus is it just actually pretty? Is it just a, a bit of a laugh? And there, there was a case so. um, in Australia a few years ago uh, which, which ended up not really being a case about fair dealing, but um, it was about the panel, that show that used to be on um, Channel nine ten, ten. ten. Uh, and ten. so yeah. on the panel they had a, a panel of people who I don't know if you remember the show and they would show a clip from something that had happened in the week and then they would comment on it um, and channel nine sued channel 10 uh, because they'd used a whole lot of um, broadcast clips from channel nine broadcasts and at one point it went to the high court over a, on a different point but at one point in the in the cases um, the the court actually went through each clip and said, you know, that one is that one was reporting news because that had happened that week, um, and and that was news. But this one was someone singing happy birthday. That was not. It wasn't news. It wasn't criticism or review. It wasn't any of those those things. Um, uh, that case was probably one of the reasons why we ended up with a parody and satire exception in the act because a lot of people thought that a lot of that would have been covered by parody and satire. Um, that was before that, that went in. But, yeah, you look at it on a on a clip-by-clip -clip basis and, and look at the purpose and then you look at whether it's fair. This is a little hypothetical. I film a street performer performing an out-of-copyright work. What rights does that? What do I owe that performer if I if that music is nice and I feature that music in a scene? Performers' rights in the in the taxi. So, um, it's how the, we chill out. Us yeah. copyright <laughs> <laughs> It was a great great discussion. Um, so, if the music's out of copyright, uh, then the the performer. A, a, person has the right under the copyright, it's not really a copyright, but there is a performer's right um, to uh, stop an unauthorised recording. So you couldn't secretly record the performer um, and you, you really ought to get a release from them because they, they might have rights in relation to... Well, you don't have to pay them anything necessarily. Get a release. Just get a release. Um, because there was a change. But what about the mechanical? Well, if the music's out of copyright, copyright. it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. 
Because there was a change. There was a change to the copyright where performers now have certain controls so, so over, over what they do. That's, that's the change. There's performance protections and there's also, in relation to a sound recording, there's if, if you record something live, then the performer doesn't have the same... If, if you perform something in a studio, then the person who's performing the music is actually a maker of the sound recording and so they've got rights in the sound recording. But all anyone does is just get a waiver from them all. So they put all the provisions in the Act and then everyone just drew up a waiver and it's there at the door and you get people to sign it. Is the, the age of the smartphone kind of ridiculing this all because we can all film performances and put them live on multiple platforms all the time now? I mean, how does this affect the legal situation for filmmakers? You know, you, you go to a co you go to a concert and you see somebody sing a song, and you you got your phone out and then you stick it up on YouTube. I mean, you well, know. so in Australia, um, there is a, a YouTube has a license in in terms of the music. I, I can talk about the music in in uh, in relation to that situation. So um, it's an unauthorized recording. If someone records a live performance on their iPhone, there'll be signs all over the place saying don't record it, they can kick you out if they catch you. Um, so the performer would be able to do something about the unauthorised recording. Um, but assuming that doesn't happen, because it's not really very practical, uh, the music itself um, is, is licensed under a blanket licence to YouTube, but it's still subject to the takedown procedures that YouTube also offers. And so... Um, so there's a license that says YouTube's not infringing, but if the copyright owner doesn't like that um, recording being up there, it will be able to take it down really, really easily, uh, and and you can, it'll just be gone. Um, oh, and we were discussing another really interesting conversation that Grant and I were having earlier today <laughs> was about how different copyright owners have different attitudes to that material, and so. There are some copyright owners who don't have a, as big a problem with stuff being up on YouTube that's taken you know, snippets of live performances. Um, I think that uh, probably straight music copyright owners probably have a bigger problem than some live theatre um, copyright owners. That's just a very broad generalisation, um, but then some. I'm saying that you you cannot find. I cannot find on YouTube anything to do with um, and any recordings of the musical Hamilton, and I can't imagine that they aren't being made and uploaded. I think that the producers of Hamilton must have a phenomenal um, takedown procedure in place. Well, there's also. A new thing that happens now, if you ever go to a premiere, is your phone is taken before you go into the theatre. Yeah. So there's there's other issues. Any other questions? Because we're really over time, and oh my God, there's quite a few. Well, could we have the person next to you because they haven't actually had a chance, and because and we might need to wrap it up after yours, and then it's up to the uh, our friends here. So yeah. Um, can I just ask you uh, to comment on jurisdiction? So we've got copyright acts in various countries. What happens if somebody infringes my copyright there in America? Is it the country that it's infringed in? Is it me bringing it back to here? So um, it depends what it is that they've done. But yes, so generally we've got the principle of national treatment. And so uh, a person who's an American person whose copyright is infringed here sues under Australian law because the, the infringing act has taken place here. Um, if your rights are infringed in America, you would sue under American law. Um, there are some circumstances in which you could sue in Australia, but it would be under American law. That would be really expensive and complicated and a pain. Um, but uh, generally speaking, you would go with the law where the infringement has taken place. And so that that is a real issue for different durations because there are some countries where copyright is still only protected for 50 years plus the life of the author whereas in Australia it's 70 years plus the life of the author so even even countries like China now have a, a copyright regime but there are some countries where it's going to be much more difficult to enforce your rights uh, than than others um, I mean it's the same in, in America 
they have a system of statutory damages. So if your rights are infringed in America, you're going to get much, much more money than you will in Australia because under Australian law, generally the courts will award a licence fee amount and maybe additional damages if the infringer has behaved particularly badly. But in America, there's, it's all set out in the Act and you get something like $3,500 per infringement. So if you've got something online, that's how all those grannies get the $3 million. So the internet, um, somebody might actually sort of do an infringement in America, yep. give it out to England, give it out yep. to all sorts of... And it goes globally around so, within so that's a matter an, of that's seconds. An infringement. So in, in relation to something on the internet, you've got, they've, uh, they've copied it in America, but they've uploaded it to YouTube, and YouTube, uh, it, it, if, if someone's looked at it here, that's an infringement in Australia. And so you can, you, you can sue in your most convenient jurisdiction, basically. I just want to say, uh, say thank you very much to Kate, to Grant, and to Laurie, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you very much. And I have, I have been asked to do one further thing to remind us all that one of the greatest physicists in the world died today, um, Stephen Hawking, um, which is a, someone who's done probably more for a lot of different things, but um, I was asked if we could just remember him, so um, vale Stephen Hawking. But thank you very much for coming, and I'm sure these guys will hang around if you've got a few more questions you want to grab them and ask them about. <laughs>